Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us on our, on our presentation on unit testing for uh, WebC message broker code. Um, just before we get started, I just want to confirm that uh, if anyone's online, they can uh, can hear the audio. Um, just in case we have the same issues we've had previously with the audio not being um, available. So just before we get started, I'll just go through a, a quick agenda of what we're looking um, what we're looking at. To, um, Uh, just a quick agenda, we're looking to be spending about half an hour um, about uh, unit testing of IIB code specifically, uh, unit testing of ESQL code, um, in this case we're within a compute, a compute module or a compute node. Um, so we'll spend a couple of minutes just, just, just generally discussing of, uh, a, just a general discussion about what we're looking to do with uh, unit testing and why unit testing is important and how it may uh, relate to other sorts of testing we'll be looking to do. We'll have a couple of minutes just to go through some code and just um, just talk about how uh, what makes it a challenge to test, and also then talk about what we can do to make it more testable. Uh, we'll have a couple of minutes to uh, do a quick demonstration of um, of of some um, testing through our testing framework, uh, and a bit of a demonstration about the config, uh, and then a bit of more information about the configuration, and we'll be spending a bit a little bit of time doing some refactoring of the code just to show you the, uh, the general process that uh, a developer or a team might be looking at and then we'll um, we'll continue on with uh, any um, with any questions that anyone might have so we'll just kick it off uh, please uh, let me know I've opened a chat so please let me know if I do have any questions and uh, we'll go we'll take it as we go so um, why why this presentation why are we talking about unit testing what uh, what what is useful uh, for us and our teams for doing unit testing so um, we'll start with a, a, our our take on what unit testing is and is unit testing is a, a tool um, and one of the testing testing tools we'll look at doing when we're developing an application so uh, indifference to acceptance or, or acceptance or integration testing in the case of IOB where you might be using uh, acceptance and integration tests to, to demonstrate the software or, or prove that uh, the software works a particular way or in the case of uh, acceptance testing you might be using uh, using it as a tool to gather, uh, to gather the requirements or, or uh, verify the requirements with stakeholders or users uh, in the case of unit testing we're looking at more of a uh, a smaller unit of work that we want to test to verify so it's more of a technical test unit testing alone can't necessarily um, give us full uh, clarification that our, our requirements have been met but between the combination of acceptance tests and unit tests we we can get a pretty good idea that uh, via our acceptance tests that we're, we're generally building the sort of software that the, the user are requiring through unit tests that we've um, put it together uh, and then we understand um, that we've tested the components in in a way that um, that we're comfortable with from a from a technical depth perspective So what we're talking about here with um, with unit tests for, for testing for, for message record code is um, uh, what what makes it a challenge or, or why we're doing this presentation what makes it challenging that uh, we would need to be talking about this if we came from a, a Java's um, potentially even a JavaScript or Java or .NET um, development environment unit testing is something that um, Generally, developers are already across, and there's a number of frameworks for it, such as JUnit. You know, unit. So those frameworks already support the concept of putting in uh, having a, a set of conditions and some expectations of what the test results should be. And we don't have anything similar in the in the message broker space. Uh, one of the other things about message broker is um, the code that is being developed, or sorry, the the code that's that's created with your default 
with the default configuration when you say create a compute node, it, it doesn't lend itself to be testable um, in, the, in, in the way that, uh, for example, this particular node here, uh, testing this node would, would, in, would require uh, us um, either a second set of code where we're a single node or we'd have to execute the, the node um, via the flow. Uh, and that's not a, um, a unit test approach because uh, those dependencies that make it a, a challenging uh, testing an entire IAB workflow, such as um, connections to database or independence, um, or it depends on other services. Uh, would make um, unit uh, testing this particular piece of code in a, uh, multiple ways in the same iteration quite challenging. So what we're going to look at first is what we can do or what we've been doing to um, refactor the code um, to make it more testable. So in the, if you come from a Spring background or uh, looking with Java or some of the other injection frameworks, what we're looking at doing is injecting the... Um, or looking to refactor the inputs and the outputs so that there are... Uh, uh, to a certain extent um, separated from the implementation. So what we want to do is have inputs and outputs that we can control in a way that's separate from how the code is being executed. So what we've been looking to do in this case is we've taken this particular code, which uh, is uh, looking to create, um, or is, a, is a basically a service, um, and what it takes is a, a bit of XML that contains the suburb name, and we've been looking to convert uh, or create the result which contains the PostScript that suburb. So a fairly trivial service, but uh, it's got a few um, conditional statements here that we can um, we can look to test. Uh, Right, so um, what we've got is some code. As I said, is it's challenging, challenging to test the way this uh, this code is constructed. So what I've done, and um, uh, and for the interest of uh, of demonstration, we um, we won't go into too much detail of how we've how we've done this, but we've um, refactored the same code into an entry condition, uh, so that our original uh, uh, node within that compute module works. And we've extracted the code uh, and injecting the result and uh, the uh, input uh, data as uh, references. So what we we can see now is we've got almost exactly the same exactly the same sort of code, but rather than before our code depending on uh, the uh, output and input route, which are input broker, the output route and so the input route and output route, which are uh, inbuilt um, broker data. Uh, components, we're now depending on a fairly generic re input out input reference and output reference. When our code uh, our code runs as normal, as in not in unit test, those references refer to um, in this case here, those references still refer to the input and output route. So when we run normally, we're looking about the, the same structure of the code, uh, the same structure of the data. When we're running through a test case, what we can do is if, if we can generate uh, some, some data into the environment that looks like our, our the data we'll be using um, with a real execution from the flow, then that gives us the opportunity to, um, to configure that data for our requirements. So moving on to what our test case actually looks like, um, the basic structure of the test case, and, and there's a number of different ways of triggering it, is we uh, have got an input queue, which uh, we've just got a queue name user testing and an output queue. Uh, when we go into the input queue, what we've got here is is a bit of logic in the test that basically drives the test. Uh, at the moment, we haven't got anything, so I just wanted to show you what it looks like before we start uh, we start start introducing test cases. Um, what I've done here, what I'll do here is I'll just build the bar. We'll just uh, copy the bar into our test environment, and we're going to run an ant script. Now the job of the ant script here is to um, to build the bar, do some do the necessary instrumentation so we can see what's happening in the test, or, or what's happening uh, through the pass through the execution of the test, and then deploying that bar to an environment where we can test. Um, from where what we'll do is we'll deploy the bar, we'll run our tests, capture results, and then stop our testing framework. Just wait for that to finish and we run our analysis of our report. So what we're looking in the analysis of the report is we've got some configuration that uh, refers to um, 
the code we're trying to test and also the coverage of, of what has been tested. So we can see here, we've got a coverage file, hopefully it should come up in a second. We've coverage file and it's telling us about the paths in our code. Uh, when we go and view the project, We can see in our project, uh, we've got a certain amount of coverage. And if we go to our coverage for our simple testable component that we've just talk, been talking about, hmm. we are seeing some coverage, so I might just need to run that tester. I run that analysis again, just to make sure we're picking up the um, the most accurate coverage report. Uh, so we've run our cover point. Let's we'll make sure we can pick up the most. Ah, now we're seeing our coverage of 0%. So we can see here now a uh, testable piece of code. We've got a number of conditions here, and, the num uh, and we've seen a number of different uh, paths through the code here, and none of them have actually been tested. So in the interest of being a good developer, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to look at our test case, and we'll start introducing some tests of our, of our logic just to make sure that we're um, testing our paths. So there's our original code. So I'm going to go into... Um, our test, and here's one I prepared earlier, so we'll just give our test some meaningful names. In this case, we're testing that uh, when we inject a suburb name of um, Chris into our uh, input, input data setup, which is our environment setup. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Eduard, for joining us. Um, just want to clarify that um, everyone can hear me still. Um, so what we've done, what we've done now is we've injected our um, our input data into our environment uh, via the um, the suburb name. Uh, from there, what we can do is we're going to execute our test or execute our logic. Uh, and then we're going to consume the result and pass back something, uh, a bit of XML back to our, um, our caller, just so that we can verify or give feedback to our user that the test has passed or failed. So in this case here, if the suburb matches 2911, which is what we're expecting here for, for Chris, we can say that uh, that particular test condition has passed and we'll be passing back a passed, a passed flag. So what in this case, what we'll do is we'll build our bar We'll um, copy the bar back to environment, and we'll rerun our tests. Oops, sorry, we'll rerun our. We'll rerun our tests, which uh, should only take a few seconds. So what we're looking through here is some logging from the, the test framework coming back, but uh, what, we'll, what we can see here is um, in the result is we see our tests, test number one run, and we've got uh, uh, the past result in our XML, which is what we're expecting to see. So we'll just wait for our framework to stop. And we'll run our analysis again. This time we're picking up. We can see that our coverage file, coverage file has, uh, has changed. We've got um, some more lines uh, which you can see the coverage uh, the covered as marked as true.
So when we go, now go back into our into our project and look at our, our coverage for our, for our the, the tested logic, we can see our actual coverage has actually increased from zero to fourteen percent, which is good. So in the, so as a developer, we've just uh, uh, add some more tests, proves some more of our logic is consistent, uh, and now what we can do is uh, look at our results and see what the um, the outcome of the additional tests we wrote. Um, is and from what we can see now is that oh this particular uh, particular procedure which has got our processing logic um, is actually being tested. Uh, we can see here from the the red and the orange we can see that um, there's some some of these conditions have been have been tested within our within our conditional um, uh, conditional steps. We can see this particular one uh, for the suburb name where the suburb name is equals Hawker hasn't been tested. We can see that uh, the condition where the suburb name is, is Turner uh, hasn't been tested. Uh, we can see that the condition of Crace has been tested. So the test case we wrote has, uh, has triggered one of that paths, which is good. Um, now in the interest of being a good developer, we go, well that's that's great, but we really want to get a little bit more logic, um, our test coverage of our logic. So what we'll do is we'll go back in a moment. We'll go look at our test case again, uh, and and we'll write another test. Um, so I've got two tests here, and um, the main reason I want to do uh, two tests is to show you a little bit of uh, a little bit of difference between the style of how these two tests are written. We can see here that with the first test uh, has some some setup logic. Um, around setting up the environment, so we've got a, an environment for, for test one. So we kept our environments nice and nice and separate, hopefully nice and nice and clear, so our tests are, are, are independent and isolated. So uh, the introduction of a new test can't break uh, another test because of the way the framework works. Um, so we've got our environment, and we've set it up with a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of ESQL code okay, to make that to make that test start or we'll set up. The the, the environment for that test to start. Um, now there's a lot of code there, um, and one of the things about writing unit tests is you can end up writing more code to test logic than than um, than the logic itself contains. So ideally, what we want to be looking at is minimising the amount of logic we're going to be be writing to do our test. So this is our first cut, the logic um, to set up the environment. In our second cut, um, what we're looking at here is is we're going to set up the environment a particular way. To say that these input and outputs, but what we've done is is we've used a bit of um a bit more of a, a smarter application of broker code, and what we're doing here is we're coding the um the XML directly into the test case that we want to inject, uh, and that XML will um is being parsed onto the you know, onto the bitstream for the um for the environment using the um, the cast, the cast and the um the cast and the parse. So now we end up with a an environment. Containing the same data, but we've done it in a lot less, uh, a lot less code. So the more complicated this input structure is going to become uh, for testing, the the more benefit there is of doing an approach like this, where we limit the amount of actual code we need to write. Um, again, here we can see that we've got a, a second condition, um, a second part of the code we're wanting to test um, for a particular particular sub. We want to see this result, uh, and then we're returning um, the output. We're setting up the output and, and clearing up the environment afterwards. So this time we've, uh, we'll save that and we'll just update our update our bar file. We'll go back into our uh, test project. We'll put our put our bar file in. Um, in, in uh, and we'll talk about continuous integration in a second. But normally you wouldn't need this many keystrokes to to make the tests run. But the, for the um, to make it easier to follow the demonstration, we've just uh, kept it as manual as possible. So we've, we've copied a new bar in. We're going to um, rerun our test cases via our end script, which hopefully won't take too long. Now we'll just uh, jump back in here. So previously we were looking at um, we we're looking at 14% coverage, which which is um, better than zero percent, but not you know not ideal for a large amount of uh, processing logic.
and the test is, is finished. Um, and we can see here, if we go back through the output of our test, we can see now we've got um, some XML in our, in our result from our um, reading back our MQ results. And uh, the XML contains uh, our, our container for tests, which is tests. And inside we can see test one has passed, and we can see that test two has, has passed, with a result of passed, which is good. Um, we'll then run our analysis again. Analysis is finished, and when we go back into our into our project to see uh, how our test has our test has been going, we can see that our, our test coverage is increased from um, from 14% to 22%, which is good. Uh, again, we'll go back into our, um, our testable bit of logic, and now we can see yeah, again that this procedure is, is being tested, and we can see of the one, two, three, four position paths through this piece of code, we can see that uh, two of those paths are now tested. Um, so what we've done is we've developed a test and now we're incrementally or we're giving the developer the ability to incrementally improve the test coverage as the logic comes along. Now what this means going forward is because we're able to repeat tests of this particular logic uh, isolated as a unit test away from a broken environment means it's very easy for us as developers to set up uh, continuous integration for these sorts of tests where we've got this sort of discrete logic within these compute nodes. So what that means is going forward is once I've, I'm happy with the, the level of testing or unit testing around this particular particular component or this particular ESQL, what I can do is I'll check that in and I can include that in my build process. So ideally going forward, every time a particular developer wants to change logic in um, in this particular code base, we'll be checking out the code um, for, via something like Jenkins or Bamboo, running these tests and verifying the res results. What that means is going forward, um, as we add more conditions, so we decide that we want to add some more postcodes, or we want to change, uh, if we want to add more postcodes, uh, as we incrementally add more conditions, we would see a decline in the coverage uh, of the logic. And what that would mean for um, a delivery manager or a team leader following the following the, the, the stats of, uh, of the quality of the project from, in, from the dashboard. As they see the the coverage fall, they'll they'll be able to investigate where the coverage is falling, or what um, where the new codes uh, new codes coming from, and they can go back to their developer and say, okay, well you've added some more logic, that's good, but we wanna we wanna make sure we keep a nice high test coverage, so we've got a bit a bit more surety around the logic being correct, and that we're testing all the all the paths we can we can test. That also means going forward is that, that um, if there's a requirement to um, to change the to change the postcode to the postcode to uh, suburb mapping, we can go in and we can refactor our test, see that our test breaks, verify that those um, new postcodes are valid with our with our user. Then we can go and update our code and make our test cases pass, looking to do more of a a test driven development approach. Um, it also allows us to do uh, um, have a little bit more comfort about refactoring. So, for example, if um, I decided that uh, this code, particular code here was obviously going to be a lot more efficient if I put um, this particular case first. And I refactored the code. When I rebuilt the bar, Oops, when I rebuilt the bar, copied the bar, run the tests again, I should hopefully see um, all my tests still so able to start to look to refactor the code for either efficiency or readability or uh, maintainability or the ability to, uh, for it to match standards. Um, I'm able to refactor that code comfortably as a developer without being cons too concerned um, that something I might break something that I'm, I'm not aware of or introduce a regression issue. This is the, the ability to do our regression testing, a non-breaking change where I've just improved the the efficiency of the logic, but um, in in you know a larger a larger team um, where there's more potentially more time in between when people have um start developing code, 
uh, to when the, the next changes, um, we're, we're able to protect the code base from having any um, uh, new issues being introduced when new developers come or new requirements remote requirements come in. So again, I can go back into my um, coverage and I can see that I've got my uh, still got my 22%, which is good. And I can see uh, my um, I'm still testing my two paths through the code. Grayson oh, Turner, hopefully, is Christ up. I'll we'll just double, double check that. Um, Let's double check that um, we've got the most recent version of the code. So from the analysis, and hopefully it should be reflected in our project. Oh, sorry, for some reason not reflecting it there, but I may have, may have forgotten to rebuild the bar. But hopefully you, you get the idea um, uh, about how useful this is to um, protect us during refactorings. So that's uh, uh, just trying to, to track against our agenda. That's uh, the running of the testing, uh, refactoring um, code, which is difficult to test uh, and making it more testable. And we'll just look at a couple of the configuration items um, here uh, just before we get to the end. So in this case here, we're, um, we're looking to configure it. So what we want to do is we want to ignore our, our unit testing. We don't want our analysis to be um, looking at coverage of our actual test cases. We only want to be looking at our logic. So here I've just separated out the the unit tests into a, a particular name and pattern of everything under everything with a, a name of unit test at the front is, is a unit test. So hopefully it's pretty self-explanatory. We've got some configuration here for where the, the coverage information is. And um, the rest of the the rest of the logic is the um, uh, is basically it's some ant tasks. So you can use a number of different tools. I'm using ant here because it's 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 easy and uh, it's quite well known. It's very um not it's very declarative rather than um I guess interpretive that you might get with Maven. So you can declare the steps that you need to do. So in this case here I'm I'm purging the execution group, removing the the deployed um deployed flows. I'm uh, making sure I've, I've I've cleaned up my previously uh, instrumented versions of the code. I'm um taking the bar file and what we call instrumenting it, which is makes it uh, makes it report back its test coverage. We're deploying it to an execution group for testing. And then what I'm doing is running some uh, running some tests, which is a separate test uh, step here. So in this case, I've got a unit test, MQ unit test task, uh, which um, he basically sends a message to, uh, anti-message to uh, the queue to trigger the test and, and receives back um, the resulting message. Uh, this this framework could be extended. Um, we could be looking to say, well, instead of hard coding the the data within the unit test, what we might possibly do is look at the, uh, take some data from. Um, oops, we might look to in here to take some data from the incoming message and use that that data to feed into the unit test itself. So instead of here of, of grabbing the suburb name um, from, from ESQL we're setting up here, we might actually pull it from the incoming message so we could uh, incrementally build up the test messages required to trigger trigger the data, uh, trigger the um, the tests. Uh, and then we can also look, uh, we could also look to extract uh, the results and look for this um, this pass message, so that when the tests fail, um, we can see that the, you know, test one passed, but test two failed. Um, so that's something we can definitely look at uh, doing to improve our testing framework to give it a little more value. Uh, that's, so that's uh, that's uh, the end of the uh, the demonstration. Hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully um, everyone have got a little bit of. Um, useful information of that and maybe uh, uh, something to think about when they're um, developing uh, developing their code and refactoring their code. Uh, please let me know. Uh, now if you do have any questions, um, and the easiest way of reaching me is uh, on my email, uh, richard at bettercodingtools.com. So that's our, that's our half an hour up. Um, please, as I said, please let me know if you do have any questions. Uh, I'll leave the um, the chat open for another another couple of minutes. Um, otherwise, um, 
thank you for taking your time any day to uh, uh, to uh, follow this presentation and hopefully um, hopefully you enjoyed it. So it doesn't look like there's too many questions coming out. Um, I understand there's a, well, quite a lot of material there. Um, uh, so what I will be doing is uh, just finishing up, and I will hopefully uh, send out the um, uh, recorded version of the presentation next uh, and, uh, in the next day or so, so that uh, you'll be able to read through at your um, at your leisure. Thanks again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.